Agency's Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps you deliver beautiful proposals in the cloud and close more deals. Welcome to the 50th episode of Agency's Drinking Beer. On this week's show, we're talking to Amanda Holmes, the CEO of Chet Holmes International. She's going to offer up some sales tips and strategies, tell her personal story, and outline why business owners may want to consider hiring a growth specialist. All right. Welcome, everyone. It's good to be here. So uh, you were talking just before this about um, the most popular apps in the world. Yeah. What, what is the number one app? It is WhatsApp. Yeah. Number two is Messenger, and number three is Facebook. Number four is Snapchat, and then Instagram, right? Yes. But, uh, but yeah, WhatsApp, I don't know a lot about. I know that they were actually like a it was one of those big uh, Silicon Valley acquisitions that was like billions of dollars. I believe it was Facebook uh, who bought them, um, but they were actually like a profitable app. It was like a B two not in B two B, but it was a messaging app. But it actually made money, which is rare. I'm surprised also that uh, Spotify is in the top ten because they're fairly new. Yeah, but you know, with um, Ardio going under last last year. I don't know if you know that, but I, I was a, a loyal RDO listener as far as streaming music goes, and uh, and they went they went under, they went out of business, and Apple has been trying to eat eat that, you know, fill that side of the market with uh, Apple Music. But I, honestly, I hate Apple Music. I don't like it either, actually. I found it a very frustrating, annoying experience. It is, it is. <clears throat> I, I miss the old iTunes on my my uh, hmm. my iPhone. It's not the same. Give Spotify a try. I have. I'm using oh, yeah. it now. Yeah, I'd love it's it. It's really good. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. Very good. They, they had uh, 10.2 million downloads in May 2016. Mm-hmm. I wonder if is is Evernote on that list? No. Hmm. So okay, let's uh, let's jump into this interview with Amanda now. Uh, to give just a little bit of context, uh, when we got on this call with Amanda Holmes, she uh, she decided to basically broadcast it live to her audience on Facebook. So it has kind of like a live, uh, a live interview feel to it because when we, when we did it, she was doing it in front of her audience on Facebook. Um, and also Amanda, I think we might talk about this in the interview, but, uh, about how you met her, Mm. but it was down for the Infusionsoft conference. You sat on a panel with Amanda. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had a chance to, uh, to meet her and, uh, Hang out uh, a bit and get to know her a bit better um, socially when I was down there. And uh, she met my family, and uh, she's a very dynamic person. She took over her father's company after he died, and I uh, think she was only 24 when she took it over. Um, she was studying music, and uh, so we'll go into that more in the interview. Um, but yeah, she's smart, and she you know she knows a lot about sales. Her, her dad taught her a lot, I guess, over the years, and she absorbed a lot of it. Uh, Chet Holmes wrote um, books about sales, and... And all that kind of stuff. So uh, there's some really good, good tips and suggestions on how to be better at sales, and that's what we're going to talk about. So with no further ado, let's jump into the interview with Amanda Holmes. All right, we are live on Facebook Live. So I believe everyone will be able to hear you through my speakers, and we can uh, just go ahead and, and start. Maybe if anybody has any questions as we go through, I could we could do a little bit of banter, but I will let Kyle and Kevin take it away. Yeah, this, this is, uh, is going to be fun because now we're, we're both competing for who's the host <laughs> and who's the guest. <laughs> I like that. I like a healthy competition. Okay, so thank you so much, Amanda, for being on our podcast. Now, normally when we record this podcast, it's all pre-recorded and then we go in and edit it afterwards. So we're, I'm going to have to be really careful to not like, sometimes I swear by accident or, you know, just say things. I'm, I'm going to try to be really... get it By done. accident? Come on. <laughs> it just flows out of me. Um, no, I'm going to try to be very professional now. So... <clears throat> Uh, we'd like to welcome Amanda Holmes to to the podcast Agencies Drinking Beer, um, and you know what what do you say about Amanda? She's the CEO of uh, of Chet Holmes International, an awesome company. 
um, and an all-around awesome person. So thank you for being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so for our listeners, this is really weird. This is messing with my brain. So for our listeners, we're actually recording this podcast live through Amanda's um, Facebook Live channel <laughs> on Facebook. I said Facebook a lot. Um, and okay, so our listeners know that we're recording this live. So this is why the format's a little bit different. And so is there anything you want us to say for your listeners or your, your viewers, Amanda? I think you just said it. Okay. Um, well, this podcast is, is, you know, kind of geared around just, you know, agencies and service-based companies, consultants, and how to make their, uh, improve their business and, and, uh, run it better from a sales standpoint. We talk about a lot about sales and whatnot. So, um, you know, Kevin, I think you met Amanda, where was it in Phoenix? Yeah, it was, uh, at Infusionsoft at their large event, uh, their, their big annual event. And I had the honor of, uh, sharing the stage with Amanda actually uh, on a panel. It was a partnership panel, actually. Yeah, power of partnerships, yes. profitability of partnerships. With the lovely Marcus, who from Infusionsoft, who was on our show before, and he is uh, the cuddliest of teddy bears. <laughs> Don't you just want to just just cuddle him? Yes. Man oh. crush. <laughs> I- <laughs> That's adorable. Marcus is a feel-good guy. So, yeah, no, we're uh, super excited to have you on. And I guess, I mean, Chet Holmes International is a pretty, pretty famous name. Chet Holmes has uh, uh, written a very influential book. But I guess for maybe those who haven't heard, just maybe um, just tell us a little bit about your father and, and who he was. Oh, yeah. Okay, so for those that don't know, uh, my father wrote the New York Times bestseller, The Ultimate Sales Machine, which to this day, seven years after its release, it's still number one, still hitting number one on Amazon's bestseller list. Um, He really got his big break working for Charlie Munger. All of the divisions doubled within 12 to 15 months. So that's really where he realized, oh, I have a formula for repeatable success with sales. So then he started his own company and 25 years this year is our 25 year anniversary. We've assisted over 200,000 businesses worldwide and I'm very proud to be the CEO of that organization. Yeah, that's awesome. What what's really cool about your story is kind of the the, the transition that you made because um, you know, from from what I understand, you were you were basically 24 walking into the company as the CEO, and, and you had graduated from the University of Southern California in a music career, correct? Yes. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you were on this career path to be a musician, and you've you know you've got music out there, and you had a very promising music career. What changed that made you want to become the CEO of this big company? tell you that the the beginning I wanted nothing to do with it. I right before my father passed, I was living in Asia studying under my mentor who's an Indian saint, uh, Guruji Shushri Punamji. So, I was like teaching meditation in a very beautiful blissful place in Asia and then got thrown into corporate America where, you know, hundreds of staff all 20 years my senior and I just thought, oh, I want to go back to Asia. (laughs) (laughs) And then fast forward to today, I think where the shift happened was I started interacting with our clients. I started hearing from the people that said, you know, you've changed my life, what you, what your father taught and what the methodology is in that book and your coaches and your, you know, agency, all of that really transformed my entire business. And I loved to hear such inspiring people and and I really fell in love with entrepreneurs. So I thought, well, people still want what we provide. And if I could just come in here and do it the way that I want to do it, because I could not sustain the business the way that my father built it because it was built for him. So I took the first year and a half just kind of listening and being on calls and asking questions. And then after about a year and a half, I stepped in as CEO. And for the last two years, I've been able to double our client base two years in a row. And last year, we increased marketing 2,700%. I mean, it's just been a wild ride. And it just came from me wanting to serve. 
I'm really curious a little bit more specifically. So you said when you took it over, you couldn't run it sustainably the way your father had and you needed to change things. Specifically, what was it that you that wasn't working for you anyway? And and what did you change? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, we ask the tough questions here uh, on Agency Drinking Beer. Yes. Well, I, I really... We were using a DOS modem in 2012. Right, n- n- enough said. <laughs> enough said. Yeah. Right, just stop had, there. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> we had never had an online sale. Everything was uh, purely you had to get on the phone with somebody or, you know, handwritten on pieces of paper. Um, so all of the order processing I redid, uh, our whole sales process went from radio ads to a call center to a webinar to selling our online or our training programs and, and our coaching. So I changed all of that so that now it runs automatically online through digital marketing. Was there any um, friction when you sort of came into the company and sort of said like, okay, we got to change things, we got to be more modern, uh, more streamlined? Um, you know, was there ever any point where where certain people were just like, this is the way we've always done it? What are you doing? You're changing everything on us. Oh, a hundred percent. I I let go of a lot of those people. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, it's right? For all to say, but I mean, it it was rough. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. You know paint that that was easy to do at all and I had a lot of friends and family actually that really um took uh, like took me to court and things because they saw money and they ran at it so um that was a huge awakening for me because here I am fairly sheltered when it came to you know business. I mean, I had run my music career like a business. I had released multiple records. I always had profitable tours, which is a hard thing to do. Kevin knows that. Mm. (laughs) Majority of musicians do not make their tours profitable. But uh, being in that kind of environment was a a huge wake-up call for me and just made me realize that I really, at the end of the day, it's about your integrity that you can sleep at night because people will try to take that from you no matter how you know loving your heart may be. I mean, I like I said, I came from a healing center, like practically like living like a monk to now, you know, you're in in court and I spent more time with lawyers than I did my own staff or or clients. Wow. Yeah, that's big big change. I mean, at, at least now looking back or uh, for other people who may have doubted you, you've got the proof right there. You could say, you know, we've doubled, doubled our sales two years in a row. We've done this. We've done that. I mean, um, it's, I think sometimes entrepreneurship and being a business leader is not necessarily about experience as much as, as it is is just having the aptitude, you know, mm-hmm. the personality for it. Yeah, ah, man, it's a lot of things because uh, on one hand, when people would ask me what my father did, I said, uh, I think he runs companies. <laughs> my formal training in the business was really nothing. So I had to rely on reading his book. I had to rely on watching the videos like everyone else does. Uh, I had to rely on reading his emails to, to fi- figure out what the point of this division was or what these people were. And um, ultimately, it was what he had intrinsically taught me through my entire life because my, my bedtime stories were about how he grew sales of this organization. When we'd go out to dinner with his friends, he'd be talking business strategies. So to me, it was actually common sense that this is how you build a business strategy because I've been seeing my father do it my whole life. When I was 11, I was helping him build core stories for fun on my weekends. So like mm. for me, it was obvious and it actually took me interacting with more of our clients to realize, oh, the whole world doesn't think like this. I actually have Chet Holmes embedded in me and I can actually teach more people what I know intrinsically because they don't know that. That's not how you run a meeting in normal society. That's not how you grow sales. That's not how a sales process is normally. So um, that was a cool realization. Mm. You just absorbed it from 
so young, which is different than, you know, somebody just kind of reading it later on as an adult or, or just learning it later. I mean, what are some of the, I guess, you know, I think what would be really interesting for listeners is um, because most of our the people who listen to this are running uh, small to mid-sized agencies, uh, spe- specifically sometimes software companies, but a lot of people that run consultancies or marketing companies or web design or app development companies. And, you know, what for the, for the business owners, what do you think they could learn from your company, from Chet Holmes International, or from any of the, the books or resources that you guys provide? Yeah, well, I would definitely say uh, we give Chapter 4 for free of the Ultimate Sales Machine. I mean, that chapter just changes people's lives. We call it the chapter that changes lives. So at the very least, you can go and get that. You can either Google it or go to chathomes.com, either when. Um, but then I, I would say the skill set, the one skill set that if you master that, you will have success no matter what is pig-headed discipline and determination. So anybody that's read the book is very familiar. We talk about that all the time. Um, Pig-headed discipline and determination for all the times that you hit that brick wall, for all the times that you fall, it's it's about getting back up. It's about persevering. It's about, you know, in sales, you hear six to 12 no's before you get a yes. And that's on average. 80% of sales are made up after that six to 12 contact. So that perseverance is really what makes the difference. Mm. Yeah. Would you, I think that's something that, uh, it's hard for, I mean, some people are really good at that. The people that are really good at sales are kind of used to the rejection. Um, but would you say that the majority of that you've seen that people that kind of require or, or need your training programs are the people that maybe they run a business, but they're too, e- they, they say no to, or they give up too easily. They walk away from the sale a little too quickly. Well, what we do, so our core methodology is 12 core competencies on how to grow your business. So no matter who you are, I mean, let's take Tiger Woods, for example. He doesn't have one coach. He has four coaches. Why? Because when he's swinging you know, his club, he can't see what every piece of his body is doing because he's in his body. So it takes somebody from the outside to look in on what you're doing to be able to have that that. Th- you know, two degree of separation to say, hey, did you check out this? Finding those pitfalls, finding those gaps. And the best and brightest in the world, you could be the most fantastic CEO. And I guarantee you that majority of the CEOs that are the best in their field or the best at their game have some kind of mentor or some kind of coach that challenges them, holds their feet to the fire, continually pushes them. I mean, I've heard Mark Zuckerberg say that his mentor was Steve Jobs. Mm. And I'm sure he has a couple of other ones. So um, the, the the best and brightest that I know always push themselves and know that some having that inspiration from somebody else can really assist them to take it to the next level, wherever that may be, whether it's the one sale that they missed or it's hiring another four salespeople or going into a new vertical or testing out a new product or whatever it may be. Mm. I know last time we chatted um, and – you know, I've used the word coaches, you know, as far as what you guys, part of what your service offering is. And you were like, I don't like, I don't like the name, the word coach. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tell us about that. Uh, I find that everyone today is, is claiming themselves to be coaches or life coaches. And it's, and it's becoming a very, um, uh, a word that that has just kind of lost its glamour and and value, really. So, I really call my team uh, a team of CHI certified growth specialists because mm. they are growth specialists, and and I don't want to. They're not the type that's just going to say rah rah. Let's get this done. What's your goal? Hold you to it. They actually have that experience in businesses, increasing sales, increasing marketing. Um, that they can point out the strategies that are not working and make some suggestions as opposed to just being an accountability coach or, or somebody to boost your motivation. I mean, that is one aspect of a growth specialist, but hmm. did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it is. I mean, I, there's so many different areas of growth, too, in a business, isn't there? It's like, so sales is one thing, but it's also 
uh, you know, growing your team and, and finding talent and, and keeping them and retaining them. What's sort of the scope, I guess, of the, the training that your growth specialists offer? Is it primarily focused on sales or is it just entire, uh, you know, operating and running a company? Uh, sales, marketing, and leadership, I would say, are the three main uh, brackets. But so often than not, you know, they'll we'll be having a conversation and they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, I have this operations person. They've been with me for 20 years, and I really shouldn't let them go. But they kind of stole from me twice, and I'm <laughs> debating if – and you're just like, okay, stop there. Let's talk about this. So sometimes it is just coaching them through the things that they don't want to do. Mm. Um, or, you know, 63% of businesses don't make a profit. I don't know if you knew that statistic. It's pretty alarming. 63%. Wow. So Are they all based uh, in Silicon Valley? <laughs> <laughs> that I'm was actually, low. I've actually heard three out of four funded companies end up failing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know Marcus had some interesting stats up there. I can't remember what they were, but it was staggering, actually. Yeah, those came from my research team, actually. So oh, nice. Yeah, so there's a high rate of failure. I mean, what um, in, part of what you do and what your team does is you is it that you try to help the the companies that are s- struggling or the the founders and CEOs that are struggling. Or do you focus on kind of the ones that are already, it's working, but you can help them maximize or, you know, grow or 10x or whatever they're, what they're already doing? Yeah, I mean, we have the whole gambit. So I just brought in a Fortune 500 client that went from, one of their divisions went from 4 million to 105 million in four years, which is pretty darn impressive. And now they've engaged my team, me and my team to go from a hundred million to 200 million in two years. So that's a great example of somebody that's just, you know, on fire and they're just trying to figure out how to get it to the next level. But then we also have, you know, the million dollar business that's been a million dollar business for the last five, six years since, you know, the recession seven years ago. And they're just, you know, they want to get to 5 million, but they don't know how. So Mm. it, it it depends or we get the you know their hair's on fire we're dying we're dying we need somebody to come in here and assist us and we get them clear on their focus goals and you know see what we can do Hmm. one thing i'm really curious about is that what you know everything that your father built over the you know the course of time that he was growing chet holmes international the books the videos the training um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've been doing this now a few years. You've come in. Have how much of it needs to be updated? Like, is is Amanda Holmes putting her mark on? Uh, yeah. On all these this training and sort of bringing it up to speed and maybe improving it in ways where it needs to be improved. Um, you mean our methodology? The methodology, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how how much of it is gospel special. that you stick to and how much of it do you go, you know what, he was on the right path here, but this is how you can make it better? This is a great question. So we've been teaching this methodology for 25 years. Now, um, my father started something called education-based marketing and selling 25 years ago. Today, we now have content marketing, which is somewhat close to what we teach. Um and it's cool to see that, you know, the industry is actually catching up to what my father was teaching 25 years ago. <laughs> but uh, but even so, there's still some discrepancies because content marketing could be any kind of content that you're teaching. But what a core story does, which is what we teach, is educate them first because it's always easier to sell something, to sell an education, than it is to sell your product or service. So selling an education is easier, something that's interesting to your buyer. And then... Through that education, you bring them to the logical conclusion that they don't want to work with anybody else but you. And that is missing from content marketing. So whether uh, I, 25 years ago, my father was doing it with cold calling, which we still have a lot of clients that, uh, you know, I was just talking to a client that increased his appointment setting by five and a half times and increased his uh, closing ratio by 38% because instead of cold calling and saying, hey, would you like to get a new credit card processor and get hung up on a hundred times to get three answers, they now call up and say, 
hey, we did some research and we found that 95% of businesses fail. Would you like to know some of the statistics and some of the interesting facts that we've found on how to be a successful business? Hey, great education. But they lead them through this logical conclusion that by the end, they want to work with this credit card processor. Hmm. So uh, whether it's cold calling, which happened 25 years ago, or now I'm utilizing the same strategies on Salesforce App Exchange. So one of my clients just gave me a, a chart. His marketing has increased 100%. His, leads, his lead flow has increased 100% using that educational approach, the same one that, my, that we've been teaching for the last 25 years. It's now on a different medium. So what worked on radio is now working for Twitter. What works on Twitter is now working on the app exchange. And I'm pretty darn determined to prove <laughs> that these the, the concepts are timeless. It's just a matter of adjusting them to the different mediums. Mm. You mentioned that that it's sort of there's something missing from content marketing that the core story methodology has. Yeah. What is it? What is it about content marketing uh, now, or at least the way most people think of it, that could be improved upon with with this methodology? So people don't really talk about it so much. So um, when your buyers, there's a certain buying criteria, right? So if somebody wants to purchase, majority of your clients, depending on which industry you're in, some industries have very specific buyers that are very intellectual and know everything about what they're purchasing. But for the most part, if you go into a store, let's say, and you want to buy a refrigerator, chances are your, your prospect won't really know much about the refrigerators. It takes the salesperson being able to educate them on what they need. Like for example, okay, so one of our clients is Mercedes. And, um, and we gave them, uh, we did some research for them, we built their core story, and instead of talking about, hey, here's the safety features of Mercedes, and it glides, and it streams, and it's beautiful on the scene. I just made that up. <laughs> I'm, I'm well done. <laughs> Is poetry part of the uh, Chet Holmes and Amanda Holmes methodology? I wish. <laughs> um, so instead of talking about features and benefits, they started doing their ad campaign saying, a loved one dies every 15 minutes in a car accident. And car accidents are the single most ex expensive. It costs the U.S. economy a billion dollars in medical expenses and and it goes on to then talk about there's five things you need to know to avoid disaster happening on the road to your loved ones so download this free report to get more information on what it takes to be safe so now this first doesn't just get the interest of the three percent of the people that would hear that ad that would be interested in buying it gets the entire buyers pyramid which would be nine times the amount of people the people that didn't think they were interested the people that thought they were definitely not interested or just weren't even thinking about it and then you set them up as you go so uh... if you know as mercedes that you have four things that are different from everyone else you want to teach them that so when looking for a car, you want to make sure that the airbags have this kind of uh, jet propulsion because it's been engineered perfectly that if you get this kind of jet propulsion, it could break your neck. Or you know, obviously, probably you wouldn't break your neck from an airbag. But <laughs> we're um, not fact checking these uh, examples, so don't worry. <laughs> I'm making it up. I'm I'm flowing. So there's there's a way to unseat your competition while you're educating and educating them on the buying criteria so that by the end they've said okay I need to buy a car that has a company that you know has roots in the in America because I want to be you know, I mean obviously Mercedes doesn't have roots in America but uh, you want to educate them about things that set you apart from your competition that I really haven't seen much of from content marketing and I could go a lot more in depth on that but I think I gave you a basic overview oh yeah yeah no it all makes sense is this something that you guys are using as a, as a company as an organization you know you no doubt have sales people that need to go out and get new clients for the company for your company um, how are you guys applying all of you know I assume you're you're applying all of it yourselves to go out and get new clients I'm sorry, say that again. I had five people trying to ask questions on Facebook Live. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> people are saying, yeah, you have great methodology. Love this educational strategy. Wow. Thanks, Billy. 
Uh, Eric saying people want to work with people that know what they're doing and talking about, and it's always more personal when talking to someone. Good stuff. Okay, so what was your question about getting new clients? <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Um, I, actually, anybody uh, pops in a question or, or a comment, uh, feel free to, to let us know. That's awesome. Um, my question was more around, so, you know, you go, you have um, professional, you know, coaches, growth specialists that teach this sales methodology. Yes. Do you also have a team of salespeople that go out and, and get new clients for Chet Holmes International? And do they apply the same strategies to getting clients for your own business? Well, <laughs> that's, you mean, uh, do we practice what we preach? Exactly. <laughs> Of course we do. Are you kidding me? That's that's a that's a great question though. We just I actually just updated a bunch of our messaging and and added some new um some new uh papers and white papers to our core story division and um a lot of our webinars that we do are a great example of that. Uh, for all of my coaches, I just uploaded a new script for all of them in our CRM that when following up with a prospect, instead of just calling and saying, hey, you haven't gotten back to me, call me back, click, instead calling them up and saying, hey, do you remember the best buyer strategy? It's, you know, and giving them a little piece of education in between and then saying, you know, call me back so we can figure this out for you. So, yes, we do practice what we preach. Um, and that's why we've been getting the results that we have. Yeah, and and not only practicing what uh, what you preach from uh, you know the books and the um, training videos, but also what you've brought to the company, which seems to be okay. Here's here's you know what your father did that worked, but here's how we can take it to the next you know to the next level to make it more modern and to use content, not just direct outbound sales, but actually use content and webinars and you know, um, free content offers to, to nurture leads and drive them to a sale, right? Yeah. I mean, I, it's so interesting because I really do come from the world of understanding more, understanding more radio than I do in app exchange. So it's been fun to take that same methodology and apply it to newer, newer places. Like for example, I'm taking the strategies that I learned from cold calling from my father and I'm applying them to Twitter. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, and I've been having a real fun time. You know, I, I've been on Twitter since 2009, and it wasn't until Mary, the paleo chef, tweeted me. I, I tweeted one day and just said, what's the point of Twitter? It doesn't even make any sense to me why I'm tweeting for the last, like, eight, is six years. <laughs> <laughs> and she, yeah, she said that the whole point is to network. And I realized, oh, I've been tweeting out this whole time, but really I should be networking with people. So one of my first tweets that I did in this networking extravaganza was I went on Twitter and I wrote down a quote of Ryan Dice's. I said it was a quote that I'd heard on one of his blogs or something about if you pick a product in an industry that's that's failing, it's just like rearranging your chairs on the Titanic. And I did it on a picture of a Titanic sinking and I tweeted it to him. And that started, now we're working together. Now he just was a speaker in my last event. Uh, you know, a year later, we're now interacting. And it was all because of this tweet that I had sent him in a creative way. Because we teach, you know, don't be obnoxious. Don't be another annoying salesperson. Find a way to be creative, add value, educate. But with him, I just took his own material and I blasted it out in a new creative way. And then it started the conversation that led to us working together. Oh, wow. That's interesting. It reminds me, a, a, a few weeks back, we had a guy named James Carberry on our show. And um, they, they were talking about how they use podcasting as a lead generation tool for their own, to get clients. So instead oh, of... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So instead of... They don't really care necessarily about their listenership. What they care about is that if they go... They find somebody and they go, that would be a perfect client for us. They'll say, hey, do you want to be on our podcast? Interview them as a way to start a relationship because they're a lot more likely to say, yes, I'll be featured on your podcast than, yes, I want to do business right away with you. But that's yes. how they start developing the relationship. Yes, I've had that happen to me. And I what, thought it was so? brilliant. 
somebody reached out to you or vice versa? Yeah, someone got me to be on his podcast. I'm pretty positive that there was nobody that ever listened to his podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, he told me about his uh, his product, which was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm interested in that. Yeah. But it, it totally brought me to a whole different level of having a conversation with him because he came from such a strategic place of gaining the respect. So I'll, t I'll share with you a little bit. Uh, studies sure. show that the most successful salespeople do one thing, uh, do one thing for 40% of the way to a close. You are 40% of the way to a close if you just build rapport. Mm. Studies have shown this, that superstar salespeople spend majority of their time building rapport. And building rapport, the ultimate definition of that is they like you, they trust you, they respect you. So what can you do to build respect? Be a podcast presenter. You know What can you do to build respect? Uh, I just did a whole live event um, with 13 of the top sales and marketing experts in my industry. And I offered it. It was an eight hour live event all for free for my clients and it totally put ripples through my entire industry saying you know my goal this year was hey we're not only here to stay this is our 25th year anniversary but we're actually leading the pack you know we're no longer on DOS modems anymore we've operated wow. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're tech savvy here so um, that was that was something that I used strategically to uh, just set myself apart from everyone else, but have my own virtual trade show. That's really cool. Mm. We actually had someone on that was doing something similar. Remember he was helping people promote themselves through webinars, which I thought was brilliant as well. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, it, he, it was sort of a, a higher, high-end agency, you know, like bigger ticket clients, but they would drive like traffic into a funnel and do a webinar, and they would sort of use the webinar to build rapport and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Actually, what you said reminded me of, uh, of Kevin. Kevin is like the ultimate uh, rapport builder. That's something I've always respected because I'm not as good at it, but it's, it's almost like, in your opinion, does, it do a, does a, a great salesperson need to be very extroverted, which is usually what we think of as good salespeople, is very extroverted, very friendly, very interested in people, or can you still be a great salesperson even if you're a little bit introverted yeah yeah of course you know it's funny I, I <laughs> at one of my last trade shows that we did I we put someone on the floor that was one of our researchers now in my core story division it's it's like night and day because my coaching you know consultants growth specialists on one side are all sales and marketing experts so they're loud they're boisterous they're always trying to tell you what's the best way to go because it's their job to teach people things so you have them and then you have my agency side which are writers and researchers that are all super uh, introverted uh, don't like to talk to people <laughs> I crack like eight jokes uh, in a 30 minute time span just to make just to hear somebody laugh. <laughs> they're so awkward, but I love them. Um, but I put uh, one of them, one of the guys said, hey, I'd really love to, you know, get on the floor and sell some core stories. And I was thinking, oh, gosh. No, not this guy. And he ended up outselling all my other sales guys. Wow. And, and it was just because it was matter of fact. You know, there was nothing, and people trusted him because he was just like, I'm not trying to sell you anything, which is actually one of my best converting email templates, which was just in a HubSpot ebook that came out two days ago. But in one of the lines, it says, I'm not trying to sell. And it just kind of puts people's guards down because f five years ago, 75% of B2B buyers were saying, hey, curb your sales messages. It's a little too intense. So you really have to find new ways to engage with people that doesn't feel slimy, that doesn't feel pushy or aggressive. And being an introvert and just being integrous and honest mm. <laughs> goes a long way today. Yeah. Hey, uh, Amanda, what was that? Uh, it cut up for a sec. 97%. That's all we heard. Oh. What was that one? So from 75% five years ago, didn't want to hear your sales message. Now today it's 97%. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's about being more, I guess, authentic and, and not seeming as in your face. And uh, just, yeah, like you said, putting people at ease. Yeah. 
and 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 man, social media can seriously help that because obviously everyone wants that top of mind awareness. We call it Toma, top of mind awareness. So what can you do? Well, you can push content. You can have a podcast. You can you know talk business, but doing it in a way that really shows the kind of person you are, and that's such a great opportunity in today's market. Uh, I. You know, I haven't completely, I can't say that I've mastered social selling by any means, but but using the tools of social media is just a great way to build that credibility, respect, and rapport. Mm. I love how you bridge kind of the more old school, uh, traditional Chet Home sales methodology stuff with, you know, newer, you know, the internet, content marketing, all that kind of stuff. It's a really nice way you've sort of bridged it together. Thank you. Um, it's been so great having you and thank you for being on the show, Amanda. I mean, for anybody listening who wants to learn more or who wants to kind of jump into your, uh, you know, the content that you guys offer, I mean, where, where do you think they should start? Yeah. So like I said before, and I should have probably built a URL for you guys, but, um, if you go to chetholmes.com, C H E T Holmes, like Sherlock.com, you go into our tool section, you can download our chapter four for free. It's, like I said, the chapter that changes lives, it's amazing. Um, it shows how to get nine times the amount of results from every move you make. And uh, a little bit on that educational approach that I was talking about. And, and what we talked about through this whole session of, you know, instead of just being a tactician, how do you be the strategist that sets yourself apart from everybody else? Um, so that would be a great place to start and go. It's awesome. Everybody should check that out. How, and how's your uh, how's your Facebook Live audience doing? Are they, are they <laughs> well, asking any more questions? Or I was just gonna say that uh, Billy in uh, the Caribbean is saying, "I'm so happy I stumbled upon this. I'm so glad to hear that, Billy." Thank and you, Billy. Uh, yeah, Luis is liking it too. And Eric saying thanks for the interview. You're welcome. That's awesome. Well, yeah. hello to all of Amanda's uh, Facebook. <laughs> live audience <laughs> um, okay well th- thank you again for taking the time to be on here I know that fan is going because it must be hot down where <laughs> you're at in Florida I, I've been doing little motions to everybody that can see me live on video like oh I'm dying it's so hot <laughs> the effects of Florida it's okay I can handle it <laughs> well it's great to reconnect again and hopefully um, we'll get to one of these uh, events where you're at and uh, again and um we, we unfortunately can't get to New York to that event. So, uh, but, you know, keep us in the loop. And uh, again, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. And, and once again, for the ones that are on, uh, on Facebook, how do they find your podcast? Is it okay to say that? Please, yes. Uh, well, the podcast is called Agencies Drinking Beer. Um, you could find it on proposify.biz. That's our product company. Uh, anybody writes proposals and needs good proposal software for their sales efforts, that's what we do. So it's proposify.biz um, slash podcast, and then you'll find Agencies Drinking Beer. Or you can just go to the iTunes, uh, go to iTunes and search Agencies Drinking Beer, and we'll be there. Yeah, not very often you get to talk about you guys. I know. I'm always looking for a chance, too. (laughs) How do we turn this into me? (laughs) I do have to also, uh, just a shout out to Jeannie Levinson. Uh, So proud of you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. We definitely have to speak. Okay. That was it. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) Okay. Thanks so much, Amanda. And to all your listeners, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Agencies Drinking Beer. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you rate and or review us on the iTunes store. If you have a story or lesson to share with other agency owners and managers from around the world, hit us up. Just email Kyle or Kevin at proposify.biz. And also, if you write business proposals and you want to make that process a whole lot easier and more streamlined, check out proposify.biz and sign up for a free 30-day trial. Cheers. Cheers.